Official survey suggests civil servants' pay could rise by 4.65%. KMB Driver Union wants a pay raise. China will host summit with several Asian countries tomorrow. Hello and welcome to TVB News. The result of the government's 2023 pay trend survey was released today. The survey suggests civil servants could enjoy a pay rise of 2.87% to 4.65% based on findings on the pay rises in the private sector. However, the final wage increase will be decided by the chief executive and the executive council. Veronica Lin has our top story. The pay trend survey committee today released the latest results of the survey that looked at salary adjustments in more than 100 large, medium and small enterprises in Hong Kong. The findings will be one of the factors deciding the pay rise for civil servants. The salaries of employees at all levels recorded positive growth. After deducting the average incremental salary, the net salary for high, middle and low salary band workers increased by 2.87%, 4.65% and 4.5% respectively, with salaries of those in the middle band seeing the largest increase. The final wage increase will be determined by the chief executive in council. During the past three years on the pandemic, salary adjustments among civil servants deviated from the results of the pay trend survey. In the first two years, regardless of whether the net pay trend indicator was increased or decreased, the government decided to freeze the salaries of all civil servants. Last year, civil servants' pay was uniformly increased by 2.5%. The pay rise for senior and middle-ranking workers was lower than the net pay trend indicator. Around 1,300 civil servants in their 30s reportedly quit their jobs last year, mostly moving to the private sector or abroad. So how will the government retain its manpower? Our aim is to really try to um, uh, have a comparable um, uh, salary package uh, that is not too far away uh, or too, far, uh, too, 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 uh, uh, too, too much different from that of the private sector. And that uh, we are doing other things to enhance the uh, job satisfaction of our colleagues, uh, to ensure that uh, our colleagues who perform will be able to uh, get promoted uh, earlier. Lan added that they plan to recruit earlier to fill the vacancies in advance, as well as promote it to fresh graduates. Authorities said this report is among a number of factors in determining the pay rise of civil servants. Other factors include Hong Kong's economic growth, cost of living and civil service morale. Ron Kalin, TVB News. A labor union representing drivers at Kowloon Motor Bus are demanding a pay rise of 8 percent. Fourteen representatives of the union met with the bus company's management earlier today. Union leaders said they previously surveyed their members and found that over 70 percent of them support an 8 percent pay rise. They cited rising costs for electricity and gas bills as primary reasons for their demand. The union added that several hundred bus drivers and other KMB staff have left the company to work as tour and cross-border bus drivers at the beginning of the year. Other demands from the body include an extra rest day for KMB employees. KMB management noted that as passenger numbers have not yet returned to pre-pandemic levels, the company continues to face financial difficulties, but said they will consider the workers' demands. A new roommate policy is set to be implemented for new arrivals at the University of Hong Kong's halls of residence. HKU said starting next school year, it will begin pairing local students with non-locals as roommates. The university hopes this will increase the cultural exchange between young people from Hong Kong and abroad. Timothy Lee reports. Studying overseas is often considered the easiest way to have meaningful exchanges with students of different backgrounds. But some university students may soon have such exchanges as part of a university policy. 
under a new roommate policy set to be implemented at University of Hong Kong Halls of Residence next school year, rooms housing two to three individuals must include at least one non-local student. Although authorities hope the measure will build cross-cultural friendships and increase mutual understanding, there are diverse views from students. This local student said the school's new arrangement is unnecessary. He believes that differences in culture and lifestyles could lead to conflict. This mainland student said her Cantonese is not fluent, so having a local roommate could help improve her communication skills. Lots of all the locals on my floor, they don't like the new policy. When I came, the university offers lots of welcome, welcome evenings and activities with the locals and stuff, so I think forcing them to live together is a bit, maybe not the right way to do it. Meanwhile, an HKU spokesperson said the policy's implementation was agreed to by student representatives of the university's Hall of Residence Committee. The university added the arrangement is only for freshmen moving in residential halls for the first time. Timothy Lee, TVB News. China's yearly GDP growth forecast was increased to 5.3 percent by the United Nations World Economic Situation and Prospects 2023 report released on Tuesday. That is up 0.5 percent from a January forecast. The forecasts are put together by the United Nations Department of Economic and Social Affairs. The reasons cited were robust retail growth and an apparent rebound in property sales. Another reason given was the relatively lower rate of inflation. However, recent economic data out of China points to a slower than expected recovery. Starting tomorrow, China will host the first China Central Asia Summit, which will be chaired by President Xi Jinping and held in Xi'an City. The heads of states from five Central Asian countries will attend. The foreign ministry said the summit aims to further consolidate consensus for the development of the One Belt, One Road initiative. Sharon Tang reports. Kazakh President Kasim Jomar Tokayev arrived in the northwestern Chinese city of Xi'an this afternoon. That makes him the earliest Central Asian state leader to be in Xi'an for the two-day China Central Asia Summit, which starts tomorrow. Those invited to attend the summit include the leaders of Tajikistan, Kyrgyzstan, Turkmenistan and Uzbekistan. Mainland media said this will be China's first major diplomatic event this year. This will also be the first time the leaders of these five Central Asian countries meet in person with Chinese leaders since the establishment of diplomatic relations more than three decades ago. The foreign ministry said the summit will be chaired by President Xi Jinping, who will also deliver a speech. The leaders are expected to reach key consensus based on cooperation and deepening strategic mutual trust. The heads of state are expected to sign important political documents and witness the signing of cooperation documents covering the economy, trade, investment, connectivity and other fields. The foreign ministry also noted total trade between China and the five Central Asian countries last year surpassed 70 billion U.S. dollars, a record high. It said all parties will seek to reach a consensus to work together to develop the One Belt, One Road initiative, adding the China Central Asia mechanism does not see competition with any third party. Xi'an is a symbolic nod to the importance of economic ties as the city was pivotal in the ancient Silk Road trade route that spans Central Asia. Sharon Tang, TVB News. Taiwan's main opposition party, the Kuomintang, has picked new Taipei city mayor Hu Yu Hee to be its candidate for the general election next year. KMT's chairman Eric Chu said the decision was made based on polling data and the opinions of party leaders, who, who used to head the island's police agency, said there are conflicts over divisions within the country that need to be fixed. On the same day, Taiwan's People's Party also announced its chairman, 63-year-old Ko wen Jae, will run for office. In Beijing, the Taiwan Affairs Office noted it is willing to promote peaceful development of cross-strait relations. It added the direction of a peaceful unification is to safeguard the security and well-being of Taiwan compatriots. The head of the artificial intelligence company that made ChatGPT, 
told the U.S. Congress that government intervention is needed to mitigate the risks of increasingly powerful AI systems. OpenAI CEO Sam Altman proposed the formation of an American or global agency that would license the most powerful AI systems and have the authority to take that license away and ensure compliance with safety standards. Matthew Bray reports. This hearing is on Senator Richard Blumenthal, a Connecticut Democrat, of began the Senate Judiciary Committee's hearing with a recorded speech that sounded like him but was in fact a voice clone trained on his floor speeches. Too often we have seen what happens when technology outpaces regulation. The unbridled exploitation of personal data. The purpose of this hearing was to see how artificial intelligence can be used constructively while limiting its misuse. So, the man who was behind the startup chat GBT is now nervous about it. I think if this technology goes wrong, it can go quite wrong. Uh, and we want to be vocal about that. We want to work with the government to prevent that from happening. Companies have been racing to bring AI to market, throwing endless data and billions of dollars at the challenge. Some critics fear the technology will harm society, among them prejudice and misinformation, while others warn AI could end humanity itself. So Altman himself now believes regulation is necessary. Where I think the licensing scheme comes in is uh, not, with, not for what these models are capable of today, because as you pointed out, you don't need a, a new licensing agency to do that. As we head towards artificial general intelligence mm -hmm. uh, and the impact that will have um, and the power of that technology, I think we need to treat that as seriously as we treat other very powerful technologies, and that's where I personally think we need such a, such a scheme. Also testifying were IBM's Chief Privacy and Trust Officer Christina Montgomery and Gary Marcus, a professor at New York University, who called on OpenAI to pause their development for six months to give society more time to consider the risks. Matthew Bray, TVB News. Coming up, more support from European countries for Ukraine after Russian attacks. Elon Musk talks about interest rates and Tesla. Protest in Japan against pouring nuclear contaminated water into the ocean. Welcome back. As Russia's attack on Ukraine intensifies, some European countries are responding to Kiev's plea for more military equipment. This is China's special envoy, Li Hui, is believed to be in Kiev to try to broker a peace deal. David Garrett reports. Ukraine President Volodymyr Zelensky in his nightly address, 24 hours on from this Russian bombardment at Kiev. Zelensky thanked the international coalition for their assistance with missile defense. He told Ukrainians the prime ministers of Netherlands and the United Kingdom had agreed to supply fighter jet support. Rishi Sunak confirmed this alongside Mark Rutte on the sidelines of a Council of Europe summit in Iceland and outlined why European leaders must act. Today we are facing the greatest threat to democracy and the rule of law on our continent since before the Treaty of London was signed. The meeting also heard from Zelensky in Kiev. Dear leaders of Europe, today Ukraine went through a difficult challenge, an intense Russian missile attack. Such challenges are what we all have to pay attention to now. At three o'clock in the morning, our people woke up to explosions. All missiles were shut down, including ballistic ones, 100 percent. Zelensky later called the pledge of fighter jets from the UK and Netherlands a good start. The Russian Defense Ministry claimed the air attack on Kiev destroyed a US-supplied Patriot air defense system. Reuters confirmed, citing US sources, that it was at least damaged. This is China's special envoy Li Hui visits Ukraine to try and broker a peace deal before going to other countries such as Poland, France and Germany. He is the most senior Chinese diplomat to visit since Russia's invasion. 
This visit came following a phone conversation between Zelensky and President Xi Jinping last month. David Garrett, TVB News. Elon Musk gave a wide-ranging interview to CNBC in which he spoke on topics ranging from AI to U.S. interest rates policies. The owner of Tesla, SpaceX and Twitter appeared unhappy about the Federal Reserve's pace in making decisions. Tracy Furness has more. My concern with the, the, with the, the way the, the Federal Reserve is making decisions is that they, they're just operating with um, too much latency. Basically, the, the data is, is, is somewhat stale. So, they, so the Federal Reserve was, was slow to raise interest rates. Um, and, and, and now I think they are, are slow to, they're, they're going to be slow to lower them. Regarding Twitter, he recently hired advertising veteran Linda Yaccarino as CEO to woo back advertisers who fled the social media platform when he bought it in October 2022. He also wants to free up his time for other projects. Twitter is, is, is very much an advertising dependent uh, business. Uh, Linda is obviously incredible at that. Linda will operate the company and, and, and I will build products. The only real currency is time. Time is the only true currency. So where are you going to spend the currency now that you don't have to spend as much at Twitter? Um, well, I, I'm going to be devoting a lot more time to, to Tesla. Okay. Um, and um, especially on the, on the AI development um, and uh, new, new product development. The, and, and then there's, and, and I'll also be allocating some more time to uh, getting Starship to orbit. Musk said there's a strong probability that AI will make life better, but there is a chance it will go wrong and destroy humanity. Hopefully that chance is small, but it's not zero, he added. Musk is hopeful that self-driving cars will be a reality very soon. It does look like it's going to happen this year. Why? Well, we're now at the point where um, the car can drive on highways and in cities with... Um, and where an, uh, a human intervention is extremely rare. Tracy Furness, TVB News. In Japan, hundreds of protesters staged a rally in Tokyo against the government's plan to push through the nuclear contaminated wastewater from the crippled Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant into the sea. About 500 protesters, including lawmakers and Fukushima, prefecture residents gathered in Hibiya Park in Tokyo to express their strong opposition to the discharge plan. Ignoring opposition at, the, at home and abroad, the Japanese government decided on April 13, 2021, to dump millions of tons of nuclear contaminated wastewater from the power plant into the sea. And back locally, the Hong Kong International Airport Logistics Park in Dongguan has started a pilot scheme to enhance its one-stop cargo service. The Hong Kong Airport Authority expects the park will handle 2 million tons of cargo a year. Greater Bay Area's export cargo can now get to Hong Kong International Airport by ship instead of trucks. Starting from mid-April, export cargo will complete security screening, loading and packing, and cargo acceptance at the Hong Kong International Airport Logistics Park in Dongguan, with support from Hong Kong International Airport and Airport Authority Hong Kong staff. The cargo is then shipped to the cargo terminal of Hong Kong International Airport for direct air shipment to overseas destinations. Under the pilot scheme, the park can handle up to 100 tons of cargo a day. Approved by the Civil Aviation Department of Hong Kong, all procedures comply with local security regulations. The Hong Kong Logistics Park in Dongguan, together with this uh, sea, sea air intermodal transport, is meant to reduce the cost uh, by about half and also reduce the time by about one third. Uh, in this way, we would do a better role in terms of a double gateway linking um, Greater Bay Area to the rest of the world. The cargoes usually arrive at the logistic park by 6 p.m. the night before. After all the procedures, they can make it to the flight the next morning. It shortened the operation time by half day. The park is expected to handle 2 million tons of cargo a year after it moves to its nearby bigger site that is closer to the pier. This will take place in 2025. Sakurai, TVP News, Dongguan. That's the news. Thanks for watching. Bye for now.